Here we are finally at Ezra's Eagle and thank you all for watching. There are two videos linked in the description and if you haven't watched them I highly recommend that you do. Um, they have a lot of uh, foundation material. If you choose not to and as we're going through this discussion if you just uh, don't agree with anything that I say or don't understand why I said it then I hope you'll go back and watch those two videos and then give this presentation a second chance. Video 1 covers Daniel through chapter 10 and I created that video. I did not create video number 2. It covers Daniel 11 and 12 and it was published 11 years ago and it is excellent. It covers everything that I wanted to and I'm 100% in agreement with it. And if I have any complaint, it is that the video is so well done that it makes my novice attempts look bad. So I only hope that the material itself that I present makes up for uh, my shortcomings. I would also like to express sincere gratitude to Michael B. Rush and many others who have uh, promoted that interpretation. Um, it was watching these videos that made me aware of Second Esdras. I began my own study and w I did so with only the intention of reading the source material. Fully expected that I was just going to be fully gung-ho and on board with uh, that interpretation. But, you know, during my reading, I found that there were things that I didn't feel quite right about. I felt didn't exactly fit. And I, I will right up front say that uh, Michael's scholarly bona fides tower over my own. I don't think that I have anything special as far as education it is with, uh, you know, honest humility and a small bit of trepidation that I put forth my interpretation, which is so different. I hope Michael and others see my efforts as simply seeking the truth. You know, I didn't set out to go after anybody or uh, anything like that. I fully expect that many people are probably going to respond with some anger because it is so far outside of, you know, what they currently believe. I do welcome criticism that is offered in a spirit of helping me understand better and that is done with mutual respect. And I absolutely encourage this. I want my ideas to be refined by the fire of criticism. And I would appreciate that those criticisms are about specific things. And please don't just tell me I'm dumb. At any rate, we can watch and wait until January 20th, 2025 and see what happens. You know, if things uh, in this election and so forth unfold, like Michael, I'm completely uh, prepared to be wrong. Um, but, you know, again, let's wait and see what happens. If things don't unfold the way that the current interpretation uh, expects that it will, I hope at that point at least that others will maybe look at this, at this alternate perspective and, and, you know, go from there. And I also hope that everybody goes back and actually reads uh, Second Esdras 11 and 12 multiple times even. Um, I think that anybody presenting ideas like this, probably the main thing should be not to convince anyone of your idea, but at least get enough interest that they go and read the scriptures themselves. And I do realize that uh, Second Esdras is apocryphal, so it isn't a canonized scripture. Um, but again, obviously, I feel like it's very important because otherwise I wouldn't be doing this. Let's go to 2 Esdras chapter 12, which is actually the interpretation. And I would have liked to have done the vision first, but I think that it's important that we 
uh, get started refuting or clearing up some of the things that, uh, that the current interpretation have. So starting in verse 10, and he said unto me, this is the interpretation of the vision. The eagle whom thou sawest come up from the sea is the kingdom which was seen in the vision of thy brother Daniel, but it was not expounded unto him. Therefore now I declare it unto thee. So from this we know that first the eagle represents a kingdom that was shown in the vision of Daniel. And second, we know that that kingdom was not expounded to Daniel. If Ezra's eagle is solely or mostly about the United States, we must identify a kingdom in Daniel that also represents the United States. And videos one and two cover all of Daniel and shows that Daniel was explicitly told the identity of every kingdom and every beast or image that represented a kingdom except for one. And in my opinion, this is the, the fourth beast of Daniel 7. And I encourage you to read all of Daniel and see if I miss something. And again, also please refer back to videos one and two for um, me covering all of that. So if we agree that the fourth beast and Ezra's eagle represent the same kingdom, and we believe that Ezra's eagle is about the United States, we also need to show that the fourth beast or some other kingdom in Daniel also represents the United States. And I tried to do this and could not do it, but I am very fallible. So for sure, somebody else might be able to. Maybe it's already been done. I couldn't find it. So another point that is commonly used to indicate that Ezra's Eagle is about the United States is because the, because the last days are mentioned in chapter 12. Reading all of chapter 12, I think prov provides context that this is not the case. In chapter 12, starting in verses uh, 13, and going through verse 21, we are told all about all of the 20 feathers. And it is not until verse 23 in the interpretation of the three heads that the last days are mentioned. And it makes no sense to me that if the entire eagle is about the last days, that the angel didn't just start out, that, start out with that at the beginning. Um, you know, why wouldn't he just indicate right from the start, you know, and this is what's going to happen in the last days. So I think that, again, if you read all of chapter 12, for me, it was very clear that it was only when he turned to talk about the three heads that he specified that this was in the last days. And, oh, yes, I will get into more detail on that later. So now, now let's go back to chapter 11 and review the vision and I will have minimal comment on it and then we'll go through the interpretation, identify the 12 feathers, the eight contrary feathers, the three heads and the body and also the lion that came and rebuked uh, the eagle. So in 2 Ezra chapter 11, starting in verse 1, verse 1, Then saw I a dream, and behold, there came up from the sea an eagle, which had twelve feathered wings and three heads. And I saw, and behold, she spread her wings over all the earth, and all the winds of the air blew on her and were gathered together. And I beheld, and out of her feathers there grew other contrary feathers, and they became little feathers and small. But her heads were at rest. The head in the midst was greater than the other, yet rested it with the residue. Moreover, I beheld and lo, the eagle flew with her feathers and reigned upon earth and over them that dwelt thereon. 
And I saw that all things under heaven were subject unto her, and no man spake against her, no, not one creature upon earth. And I beheld, and lo, the eagle rose upon her talons, and spake to her feathers, saying, Watch not all at once, sleep every one in his place, and watch by course. But let the heads be preserved for the last. And I beheld, and lo, the voice went out, not from her heads, but from the midst of the body. And I numbered her contrary feathers, and behold, there were eight of them. At this point, where we've been told that the eagle has 12 feathers, eight contrary feathers that were short, and three heads that will be preserved for the last. In verse 12, And I looked, and behold, on the right side there arose one feather, and reigned over all the earth. And so it was that when it rained, the end of it came, and the place thereof appeared no more. So the next following stood up and reigned and had a great time. And it happened that when it rained, the end of it came also, like as the first, so that it appeared no more. Then came there a voice unto it, saying, Hear thou that hast borne rule over the earth so long, this I say unto thee, before thou beginnest to appear no more. There shall none after thee attain unto thy time, neither unto the half thereof. So I just want to point out that we do not know who this voice is. And also, the interpretation is going to differ somewhat from what was said here. And it's in a significant way. And so I think that we need to lean more toward the interpretation than the vision itself. Anyway, continuing in verse 18. Then arose the third, and reigned as the other before, and appeared no more also. So went it with all the residue, one after another, as, they, as that every one reigned and then appeared no more. Then I beheld, and lo, in process of time, the feathers that followed stood up upon the right side, that they might rule also. And some of them ruled, but within a while they appeared no more. For some of them were set up, but ruled not. After this I looked, and behold, the twelve feathers appeared no more, nor the two little feathers. So again at this point, the twelve feathers are gone as well as two of the contrary feathers. We will designate these as contrary one and contrary two. And these all seem to be prior to the last days. And there was no, and going in verse 23, and there was no more upon the eagle's body, but three heads that rested and six little wings and wings and feathers are used interchangeably. Again, at this point, we have three heads and contrary feathers, three through eight. Then saw, saw I also that two little feathers divided themselves from the six and remained under the head that was upon the right side for the four continued in their place. So these two feathers, I'm gonna designate as contrary seven and contrary eight and we're going to learn that they are saved for the last in verse 25 and i beheld and lo the feathers that were under the wing thought to set up themselves and to have the rule and i beheld and lo there was one set up but shortly it appeared no more this is contrary feather three and verse 27 and the second was sooner away than the first. So this is contrary feather number four. And I beheld and lo, the two that remained thought also in themselves to reign. This is contrary feathers five and six. Verse 29. And when they so thought, behold, there awakened one of the heads that were at rest, namely it that was in the midst for that was greater than the other two heads. 
So the middle head is the strongest and it awakes to stop contrary feathers five and six from, from raining. So contrary feathers one through four seem to be what is contrary feathers one through four seem to be before the last days, but contrary feathers five and six and are what awakens the three heads which is when the interpretation says, okay, we're in the last days. And then I saw that the two other heads were joined with it. The other two heads wake up also to join with head one. And behold, the head was turned with them that were with it and did eat up the two feathers under the wing that would have reigned. So the three heads devour contrary five and contrary six. But this head, talking about the, the one in the middle, put the whole earth in fear and bear rule in it over all those that dwelled upon the earth with much oppression. And it had the governance of the world more than all the wings that had been. And after this, I beheld and lo, the head that was in the midst suddenly appeared no more like as the wings. The, the middle head just disappears suddenly. Verse 34, And there remained the two heads which also in like sort ruled upon the earth and over those that dwell therein. And I beheld, and lo, the head upon the right side devoured it that was upon the left side. Then I heard a voice which said unto me, Look before thee, and consider the thing that thou seest. And I beheld, and lo, as it were a roaring lion, chased out of the wood. And I saw that he sent out a man's voice unto the eagle, and said, Let us point out, at this point, only the head on the right, and feathers C, contrary 7 and contrary 8, are left. Verse 38, Hear thou. I will talk with thee, and the highest shall say unto thee, Art not thou it that remainest of the four beasts, whom I made to reign in my world, that the end of their times might come through them? The little bit that remains of the eagle is all that remains of all of the four beasts from Daniel 7. And so the four beasts cover the time period from Babylon until the very end of all unrighteous dominion. In verse 40, And the fourth came and overcame all the beasts that were past, and had power over the world with great fearfulness, and over the whole compass of the earth with much wicked oppression. And so long time dwelt he upon the earth with deceit. Again, this is talking about the fourth beast, which began in the Roman Empire and these final remnants that are now being rebuked by the lion. Verse 41, For the earth hast thou not judged with truth, for thou hast afflicted the meek, thou hast hurt the peaceable, thou hast loved liars, and destroyed the dwelling of them that brought forth fruit, and hast cast down the walls of such as did thee no harm. Therefore is thy wrongful dealing come up unto the highest, and thy pride unto the mighty. The highest also hath looked upon the proud times, and behold, they are ended, and his abominations are fulfilled. And therefore appear no more, thou eagle, nor thy horrible wings, nor the wicked feathers, nor thy malicious heads, nor thy hurtful claws, nor all thy vain body, that all the earth may be refreshed and may return, being delivered from thy violence, and that she may hope for the judgment and mercy of him that made her. So let's move into chapter 12, which continues the vision. Verse 1, And it came to pass, whilst the lion spake these words unto the eagle, I saw, and behold, the head that remained and the four wings appeared no more. 
and the two, which are uh, contrary seven and contrary eight, went unto it and set themselves up to reign. And their kingdom was small and filled with uproar. So the final head and the four wings, which are again contraries three through contrary six, are no more. Contrary seven and contrary eight set themselves up to reign, and it's a small kingdom full of uproar. And the first thing that came to my mind was Israel. But I don't know that. It's just, again, what seems to fit. Or rather, it's what came to my mind. And so as far as contrary eight, it seems that contrary seven and eight are kind of combined into one small kingdom. So maybe contrary eight is Palestine. Um, I could also see that contrary eight might represent the Antichrist, or it could be something completely different. I'm not sure. In verse three, and I saw, and behold, they appeared no more, and the whole body of the eagle was burnt, so that the earth was in great fear. Then awaked I out of the trouble and trance of my mind, and from great fear, and said unto my spirit. So, just want to make a note that the eagle is burnt, and this is just like the fourth beast with the ten horns, is burnt in Daniel 7 and reading that it says I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame so again I think this is an indicator that Ezra's eagle is a match for the kingdom of the fourth beast so the next several verses of 2nd Esdras 12 is Esdras pleading for an explanation which is received starting in verse 10. And he said unto me, this is the interpretation of the vision. The eagle whom thou sawest come up from the sea is the kingdom which was seen in the vision of thy brother Daniel. But it was not expounded unto him Therefore now I declare it unto thee. Behold, the days will come that there shall rise up a kingdom upon earth, and it shall be feared above all the kingdoms that were before it. My interpretation is that this uh, beginning kingdom is the Roman Empire. And in the same shall twelve kings reign, one after another whereof the second shall begin to reign and shall have more time than any of the twelve. So if you'll remember in the vision, it actually said that it would have more than double the time of anybody else. In the interpretation, it just says more time than any of the other twelve. And in verse 16, it says, And this do the twelve wings signify which thou sawest. So these 12 feathers, I believe, represent the 12 Caesars of the Roman Empire. And based on Ezra's eagle being the fourth beast kingdom of Daniel 7, um, again, like I said before, I found no reference in Daniel that I could match to Latter-day America, especially anything that would specifically start a kingdom with uh, President Hoover. So, note that also that the interpretation uh, about the second feather having longer time than the other 12, this does make uh, FDR a plausible second feather, but it also matches the reign of the second Caesar, Augustus. And the 12 Caesars in chronological order were Julius Caesar, from 49 BC to 44 BC, about five years. Augustus Caesar, 27 BC to 14 AD, which was roughly 41 years. Tiberius Caesar, from 14 AD to 37 AD, and that's roughly 23 years. Caligula, 
37 AD to 41 AD, roughly four years. Claudius, 41 AD to 54 AD, 13 years. Nero, 54 AD to 68 AD, 14 years. Galba, 68 AD to 69 AD, one year. Otho uh, was only for months of 69 AD. Vitellius was also only months of 69 AD. Vespasian, 69 AD to 79 AD, 10 years. Titus, 79 AD to 81 AD, two years. And Domitian, 81 AD to 96 AD, 15 years. These, I believe, are the first 12 feathers. I'm not the first person that made this connection, although I do just want to say that I reached this conclusion on my own. It was as I was reading through Second Esdras for the first time and came to this part, the first thing that came to my mind was how many Caesars were there? And I googled it and lo and behold there were 12. and. Again, not saying that this is correct, but other people have also reached this conclusion. Covers the 12 feathers from my perspective, and that leaves us with the eight contrary feathers and the three heads. So in verse 17, As for the voice which thou heardest speak, and that thou sawest not to go out from the heads, but from the midst of the body thereof, this is the interpretation that after the time of that kingdom there shall arise great strivings, and it shall stand in peril of falling. Nevertheless, it shall not fall, but shall be restored again to his beginning. So after the Caesars, there were centuries of civil war. Many emperors reigned, some only for a few months. The voice from the body I believe means the body of the people, which were again, there was a lot of unrest causing all of the civil war, but that's my own interpretation. It could also be that this uh, voice from the body is the spirit of Antichrist that motivates both Ezra's eagle and the fourth beast. So it could be one of those could be something else. Mostly it's just important that the voice is distinct from the heads and the feathers and is coming out from the, the, from the body. So despite the great strivings of the Civil War, um, it shall not fall but be restored again to his beginning. And I believe that this is the Holy Roman Empire, which is also, in the image from Nebuchadnezzar's dream, I believe that this is where the legs of iron transition into the feet of iron mixed with miry clay. And I have more details on that in video one. This is not designated as a feather, and it would not fit as a feather as we're told that the eight feathers only have a short time. And the Holy Roman Empire obviously covered uh, many centuries. So it's more like there was the Roman Empire and then the Holy Roman Empire, which is it being restored again to his beginning. That's my opinion. Verse 19, And whereas thou sawest the eight small underfeathers sticking to her wings, this is the interpretation that in him there shall arise eight kings, whose times shall be but small, and their years swift, and two of them shall perish, the middle time approaching. Four shall be kept until their end begin to approach, but two shall be kept unto the end. So at this point, I don't have the identities of uh, contrary feathers one and two, just that they perish the midst, the middle time approaching. In verse 22, it says, And whereas thou sawest three heads resting, 
This is the interpretation. In his last days shall the Most High raise up three kingdoms and renew many things therein, and they shall have the dominion of the earth. So as I mentioned before, this is the first mention of last days. And at this point, we have three heads and six feathers or wings. This is where my interpretation diverges greatly from anything that I have seen presented by anyone. In verse 24, And of those that dwelt therein, with much oppression above all those that were before them, therefore are they called the heads of the eagle. So these three heads are much more powerful, much more oppressive than anything that has come before them. For these are they that shall accomplish his wickedness, and that shall finish his last end. And by this it means that the three heads will accomplish to the fullest the purpose of the fourth beast, which is to oppress the holy people. In verse 26, And whereas thou sawest that the great head appeared no more, it signifieth that one of them shall die upon his bed, and yet with pain. Now wait, we are down to the heads are dying, but chapter 12 doesn't appear to address uh, four of the six feathers. And so we're going to need to go back to chapter 11 to see what happened. And it turns out that these feathers are very important to understanding what's going on. So again, in the interpretation, those feathers aren't mentioned other than that they are included as uh, being numbered among the eight contrary feathers. And so I do want to go through uh, contrary feathers one through four, and I, I'll be the first to admit my interpretation on these is a bit sketchy. I'm not confident in them, but I'm basically taking my best guess, I'll say. So the Mongol Empire is a good candidate for contrary feather one, as it covered much of Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. And it was in the early 13th century, but it quickly collapsed after the death of Genghis Khan on August 18th, 1227. Um, the Ottoman Empire began to rise shortly after the Mongol Empire, but it reached its zenith under the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent, who ruled from 1520 to 1566. And also at this time, it controlled significant parts of Europe, Asia, and Africa. So again, I believe this is a good candidate for Contrary Feather 2. The reign of Louis XIV is considered the golden age of the French Empire from 1643 to 1715. And this might be Contrary Feather 3. The Napoleonic era also transformed France into an empire from 1799 to 1815. And this also included much of Western and Central Europe, Spain, Portugal, occupied uh, parts of Egypt, and they also invaded Russia successfully, but that ended pretty badly. So again, this is my best guess for Contrary Feather 4. At this time, I need to come out and just say who I believe Feathers 5 and 6 are, and who the three heads are, and this is where I diverge from everybody else. This is kind of what everything that I have uh, done so far is building up for. I will identify them, and then we'll continue through chapter 12 and see how well things line up. So I believe contrary feather five is Prussia, which is Germany under Kaiser Wilhelm and the Second Reich. And contrary feather six, I believe is Nazi Germany under Hitler and the Third Reich. The head in the midst, which was the most powerful head and also the first head to awaken 
because of these contrary feathers, is Britain. The British Empire was the largest and most oppressive empire of all time. The head on the right, I believe to be Russia, but it may also be the United States. The head on the left, I believe to be the United States, but it may also be Russia. So those two heads, not 100% clear on, but again, I lean toward Russia, the second head, the United States, the third head. So Britain awakens first and is joined by Russia and the United States. And World War I is the devouring of Contrary Feather V. World War II is the devouring of Contrary Feather VI. And going back now to verse 26. And whereas thou sawest that the great head appeared no more, it signifieth that one of them shall die upon his bed, and yet with pain. According to this, Britain suddenly appears no more, and I would say that that means as a global superpower, not that the nation ceases to exist completely. So at the end of World War II, the Bretton Woods Agreement made the United States dollar the global reserve currency, and Britain indeed was dead in the sense of global influence. The part about died upon his bed and yet with pain, I think is saying that unlike the other two, he does not fall by the sword. Uh, the great pain, I believe, is that Britain paid a great price during World War I and II, and yet when the beast system was done with them and you know didn't have any further use for them, it quickly discarded them and they were um, kind of removed with this Bretton Woods Agreement from power. And this left the USA and the USSR as the two global superpowers. Verse 27, for the two that remain shall be slain with the sword, for the sword of the one shall devour the other, but at the last shall he fall through the sword himself. And referring back to uh, chapter 11, verse 35, we see that the head on the right devours the head on the left. It could be understood that the U.S. won the Cold War and that and that left it as the sole remaining head. But I do not think this is correct. For one thing, the Cold War defeat was not exactly dying by the sword. Uh, Russia lives on and is uh, an, impor an important part of BRICS and the BRICS Plus Alliance. They currently preside over the BRICS Alliance. And so it remains to be seen, in my opinion, which head devours the other, but my belief is that it's going to be Russia that will be the head on the right, and the U.S. will be the head on the left that is devoured. From other studies that I've done, I believe that there will be a dollar collapse, and that World War III will probably start. I think that New York will either be nuked or hit by a massively successful cyber attack, and that this will be uh, the fall, the final fall of Babylon that's spoken of in the book of Revelation. And if, it is an, if it's a nuclear strike, I also believe that at the same time, the rest of the country will also be, uh, receive many nuclear strikes, um, Washington, DC. And I, I do think the nation will survive, but I think that we will be knocked out of the uh, global superpower picture by this strike. So back to 2 Ezra 12, 29. And whereas thou sawest two feathers under the wing, passing over the head that is on the right side, it signifies that these are they whom the highest has, hath kept unto their end. This is the small kingdom and full of trouble as thou sawest. So it, again, it appears that the head on the right side and contrary feathers seven and eight, and also the body and the talons are all that's left of the eagle at this point. 
the two feathers, the small kingdom full of trouble. Um, as I said before, immediately I thought of Israel and again, contrary feather eight, possibly uh, Palestine or the Antichrist or something else. I think, I think Palestine's actually a pretty good likelihood, but again, not clear. In verse or chapter 12, verse 31, and the lion whom thou sawest rising up out of the wood and roaring and speaking to the eagle and rebuking her for her unrighteousness with all the words which thou hast heard. This is the anointed, which the highest hath kept for them and for their wickedness unto the end. And he shall reprove them and shall upbraid them with their cruelty. So this appears to either be Christ or the one mighty and strong or some other end time servant. And verse 33, for he shall set them before him alive in judgment and shall rebuke them and correct them. For the rest of my people shall he deliver with mercy. Those that have been pressed upon my border and he shall make them joyful until the coming of the day of judgment, whereof I have spoken unto thee from the beginning. This is the dream that thou sawest, and these are the interpretations. That pretty much wraps it up. I, thought, I hope that I've given you some food for thought. The next thing that I'm going to be attempting to do is um, reconciling everything that I've done up to this point with the book of Revelation. And I think that this is probably going to be a while um, before I have anything published because although I am pretty familiar with the apocalypse, I do feel that reconciling all of this is going to um, just be a very difficult and long process. But I do anticipate that I'm going to be able to make a pretty thorough case um, to reconcile uh, Daniel, 2nd Esdras, and the book of Revelation. So thank you so much for watching. I hope that I've pre presented a convincing case, and at minimum I hope it's given you some things to uh, consider. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe this if you thought that it was a worthwhile video. I really would like to get a lot of people watching this. Like I've said before, I'm not concerned at all with monetizing, anything like that. I just have put quite a bit of effort into this and would like to get it to a lot of viewers. Thank you again.